get, I usually get in a, a little, you know, alert that says you got to do it. You know, and they tell you, yeah, sometimes they have a 24 hour one, sometimes at four days, you know, but we're well, just chatting. Chat. Too. It's like, <laughs> we're, are you we're going, live. <laughs> are you going to let Stan down? Welcome like, everybody. Wow, we're we're gossiping in the wings. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> howdy, howdy. Happy Friday, everybody. Well, welcome to uh, the day. What is this? Day eight? Day nine? It's all melding together. It's, it's all melding together. I, I yeah. it's welcome to the day. We're we're on Friday. That much we know, of uh, Wes Johnson's Voice of Palooza, um, gathered here for the Alzheimer's Association to raise funds for an incredibly worthy, uh, very personal cause for many of us. And uh, we're we're here gathered, um, bringing together some of the the many voices of Fallout seventy six. Um, the one thing before we get started here, I wanted to remind everyone, if you can, any amount matters, a dollar, five dollars, whatever you can spare, smash exclamation point charity to donate to the Alzheimer's Association today and help us to end Alzheimer's. Um, we also got yeah. some giveaways from our friends at Bethesda and also Noble Chairs. Um, so if you hit exclamation point Noble Chairs, we're giving away a Fallout Nuka-Cola gaming chair sponsored by Noble Chairs. And Fire also, engine red and beautiful. It is, yeah. It's got the, the beautiful uh, Red Rocket pinup on the back. Top quality. Um, also, we have the 10th anniversary Skyrim gaming chair that is uh, beautifully sexy and all black with runes and an arrow to the knee. Stitched right on the seat cushion. Um, we also have uh, some giveaways for Fallout 76 game codes and the Elder Scrolls Online. Uh, with my spiel done, uh, welcome everybody. <laughs> Yeah. Welcome one and all. And thank, thank you, you for welcome. coming out to do this. Hey, all these wonderful folks, these voice actors who uh, I'm in awe to be in the same room with you guys now because we're hardly ever in the same room. We are all in our own separate uh, compartments, boxes, what have you that they say do not feed the voice actors and we don't come out. <laughs> But uh, it's great to have all of you here to help fight against Alzheimer's. And uh, for this entire week, like I say, it's been the longest day. That's why it's all blending together, because we are dropping the gloves and we're coming back against this terrible disease that uh, devastates families. Uh, to lose somebody before you lose them, to watch them slowly fade away uh, is one of the most devastating things. It's, it's the kind of thing that families don't necessarily talk about, but it, it, it hurts the people who are left behind as much as it hurts those who are taken by Alzheimer's uh, to, to have to care for somebody that when their mind goes, but physically they're still there for a while, but their personalities change. They don't remember you anymore. It's, it's painful. It's personal. It's awful. And since 1980, the Alzheimer's Association has been providing help and guidance, working to research for a cure. And we're getting closer and closer every day, which is why we ask you as we are having fun for funds over these this this entire week uh, of the Voice of Belusa panels and and uh, entertainments that we're doing, just donate a dollar, donate five dollars, donate whatever little you can. Share this with friends with the hashtag and ALZ, and let's see if we can do some good. There's so many things that are happening bad in the world right now, and yet what I have been seeing is just this wonderful light, this this shining light from the gamers. We have so many gamers out there, streamers, hundreds of them around the world, a truly global effort with Voice of Palooza right now to go out and provide entertainment, to share their love of the games and their hatred of this dread disease, Alzheimer's. So thank you in advance for everything that you do to donate. Uh, we appreciate it. The families appreciate it. I've lost my mother and my grandmother and uncle, uh, so many friends and family and people that I know, and I've heard your stories about the touches that you've had from Alzheimer's. And so we're touching back and we're gonna to touch back hard. And today we're gonna to have fun for funds and we're glad to have you all here. So I'm now off my soapbox there, Ken, back to you. <laughs> well said. Um, why don't we go around and uh, do introductions? Um, so if you wanna introduce yourselves and, uh, and what people may know you for, maybe it's Fallout 76 or maybe another role that you uh, really like, we can start off with Keith Sarabica. Hi, I'm Keith Sarabica, and I, I, I think the I just did the character a little while ago, so I'm not sure what his name is. The guy in in '76 was like uh, yeah, Doctor Blackburn. 
Dr. Blackburn, that was it. It was kind of evil running the, uh, some secret lab. You oh, know? yes. Yeah. And, uh, oh. but you probably know me from uh, 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 Fallout New Vegas as uh, the burn man, Joshua Graham, for you Fallout New, New Vegas people. Um, but I've been in about a hundred video games, I, you know, so who knows? He's like done Elvis, <laughs> Keith, you are everywhere. <laughs> it's kind of, although I don't know, you know, now that I'm getting older, I, it doesn't seem to happen as much anymore, but it's fine. I get all my pension, so I'm happy. <laughs> Nothing like a defined benefit pension plan. That's all I can tell. That, I was going to say, it doesn't matter what you look like or what age you get to. When you start doing voice acting, you can be anything, any age, anybody. The only way I've ever had six pack abs is as a video game character. So. <laughs> <laughs> Keep working away. I had six pack abs when I was younger. Not anymore. No. <laughs> uh, Wes Johnson, surprisingly here for Wes Johnson's voice of Palooza. Who to <laughs> thunk it? I, I was a really hard get for this one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, in, in uh, Fallout seventy six, I am the Protectron robots and the Fosk not or Bob or Mister. Fluffy. So those are all the robots, the Protectron robots. That's what I've been doing for a long time because you know, uh, once uh, once they get those programmed, they don't they don't like to change them. They do change their voice occasionally to talk about Nuka Cola, but uh, mm. I've done a number of things in Fallout. Uh, you know, Mo Cronin from Diamond City or Go Silver Shroud, the Mistress of Mystery, or any number of things in Shea Gorath. Daedric Prince of Madness from the Elder Scrolls and Lucy and the Chance and things like that. I just, I love doing what I'm doing and I love, uh, I love acting. And uh, sometimes it's nice not to be seen. Mm. Fair enough. <laughs> to be heard and not seen. Yes. <clears throat> yes. To be somewhere. Although I love the way that sometimes you look, you know, when you look, when you, when like you've done a performance capture and you go and you see yourself in the volume and you go, Holy fuck, that's what I look like? Yeah. <laughs> well, everybody looks great wearing uh, skin-tight spandex and ping-pong balls. Oh, it's, it's really it's very becoming with all the yeah. little dots all over, you know, especially. The balls. All the balls. <laughs> so many balls. balls. Feel a lot of balls. Right? How do my balls look? Are they good? Are they good for you? Okay. Neil walked in at just the weirdest time. <laughs> yes, Neil. <laughs> How are you, Neil? Balls. Sorry, th three words. No worries. Four, no. oh, five. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Hang on, let me reshuffle our titles You need to here. decompress <laughs> just a little bit, Neil, and, and breathe, breathe. Hmm. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to keep everybody waiting. I do apologize. No worries, Neil. We were just getting started. Uh, Chip Jocelyn. How you doing, Hi, man? guys. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me to join this prestigious panel. And um, this disease has also uh, very much affected me with a loss of a grandmother and a grandfather and uh, currently have an uncle who is suffering, who was a, uh, a pro boxer. So uh, he, um, you know, he's, uh, he's struggling. And uh, so it was uh, almost kismet that you guys asked me to join you. And I appreciate that. So appreciate um, you. thank you, sir. Um, uh, I did about, uh, I think, eight or nine voices now in Fallout 76, and the one that I think most people know is Graham. Um, the lover of meat. So he's, uh, he loves the meat a lot, and as do I. And um, uh, That should be the that, new voice of Arby's right there. Yeah. <laughs> so um, prior to that, I just did commercials and film and uh tv from time to time and um uh yeah so uh again thanks so much for uh for the invite to the party always a pleasure to have you thank you sir uh just below you jordan reynolds hey um jordan reynolds is an honor to be here amongst some amazing talent um in fall 76 i play with this amazing lower third that you put together. Uh, Ruben Gill is probably the most known character. He's in Vault 51. You never actually see him except his sad, dead corpse. Um, <laughs> but you hear him and all of his his horrible journey in Vault 51 where Zax is controlling everyone. And uh, uh, Ruben Gill becomes the overseer and he didn't want to, and he documents it all. 
in a journal. So you hear a lot of his hollow tapes. Um, so it's it was pretty messed up. Um, that that was that was definitely a, a, an emotional VO session. But just like Wes was saying, I love this job. Um, other games that you may have heard me in Wasteland Three. I literally have to look at my IMDb. I'm terrible. Uh, Wasteland Three. <laughs> I play Little Sparrow. He's a little sex robot. Very friendly <laughs> sex robot. If if that's your thing. Very um, method acting. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually good to have a friendly sex robot. You know? yeah. yeah, yeah, right. Instead of an as opposed to Fisto. <laughs> wow, wow, you went there. He, he had many appendages, or, or they. I, I think they were gender neutral for sure. But, but yeah, it was kind of like a sort of like a southern sort of. It was like if Michael Jackson was southern or something. <laughs> um, I don't know what I did. It was the choice, and I booked it. So, but um, nice. I mean, GI Joe, Operation Blackout, as Firefly and Lifeline. See, why um, couldn't you have been like a gentle sex robot in G.I. Joe? I mean, that... <laughs> it's just, they're just not and ready that for That would have been fun. <laughs> just Wes, not ready. that's the next improv prompt. There we go. <laughs> but yeah, um, so yeah, I, I could I could list other stuff, but th those are some fun games I've done. And this is, this is, I love what I do and I'm honored to be here and honored to be here for a good cause, most importantly. Yeah. So thank you for having me. There is one question from the uh, uh, the chat that came up. And somebody asked if you had to mocap for the corpse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, they they just put a bodysuit on me, and I lied down in my bed, and they fed me Cheetos. So That's why it looks so realistic. <laughs> I know. So, but but when they said action, I had to stop chewing. Um, it was, you know, it was it was a hungry day. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Shula, hello. Um, uh, yes, thank you very much for having me, and I appreciate uh, being thought of, and appreciate being here, uh, helping um, helping uh, fight such a um, a hard cause. Um, I have been very lucky to uh, work uh, in in the Fallout family. Um, who knew uh, they they wouldn't dump me? Um, so uh, you know, in Fallout seventy six. I'm looking at the, I think they have 10 characters listed here, but the, the ones that people will probably recognize are, are it says Lucky Lou, but pretty, pretty much unlucky Lou. He's our, our Yinzer, uh, you know, mm. our Pittsburgh guy, which, um, you know, <laughs> like, like, like he's like hilarious. Lots of funny stuff going on with him. And then we had uh, our Pennsylvania Dutch dude, Caleb Fisher, yep. um, was also a fun character to do. Um, but my, I would I have to say, my and and I've I've worked on Fallout Four uh, mainly in Far Harbor and Fallout New Vegas, and but I need to mention uh, Bray Husky. I did a series of hollow tapes for Fallout Four uh, Far Harbor, where uh, Bray Husky, which was an inside joke about some wrestlers uh -huh. um, that I did not know at the time and found out later on, um, the, he, he he's. The, in the hall tapes, he gets steadily irradiated um, <laughs> and is dying. And each one, he goes further down down the hole of dying. And 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 then the last in the last one, he's actually getting eaten by a gulper. So he's talking through being eaten, consumed by a gulper. Um, and then, but the but the some the, hardcore the, dedication to your self narration. It's really, I mean, and the, the but the but the bit was each and every time he didn't know how to turn off the turn off the holotape. He couldn't mm. figure out how to turn off the holotape. So each one was heightening, heightening, getting angrier and angrier as he couldn't turn off the holotape. So that is fun stuff throughout the entire. Uh, I, I, I find you know it's been a, an honor and a pleasure because I not only love doing the voices, I love the gameplay. Um, the reason why I, I got the job in the first place was I did impressions of ghouls in Fallout Three as I played it. Right. And it just so no happened way. that I got the audition back in maybe 07 or 08. And I didn't work on that game for another nine months. So it took that long. And sometimes that happens. It took that long to go through the pipeline. And then, oh, but once I saw the copy, I was like, oh, my God, this is Fallout. There's no way this isn't Fallout. These are, you know, ghouls. And uh, and so it was a blast to do all those ghouls. We so, should get all you ghouls together, all you ghoul voice actors together for a reunion. That would be great. Hey, hey there, smooth skin. So the <laughs> I played Hadrian of the Four Tops. I was the stand-up comic, like yes. the Henny Youngman of ghouls. So like, you know, to be the Henny Youngman of ghouls was an honor and a pleasure. You know, I, I, uh, I, I you know, uh, uh, Kelly, party of four sitting right here. Take my wife, please. You know, all that stuff. Was, Someone in chat is saying ghoul con 2022. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, uh, but worked in a, you know, uh, in the mafia series as well. And uh, worked, you know, uh, um, and I've done a good amount of audio gaming lately on uh, Jack Ryan, Mr. Robot and uh, Jurassic Kingdom. And, um, and as uh, Keith also does, he and I, Keith's a, a well-known audiobook narrator. I'm now an audiobook, full-time audiobook narrator. Yeah. And, um, and I've become a publisher. So I have a publishing company called Leonardo Audio that we now publish um, audiobooks. So very um, cool. But it's, it's fun to work. And, uh, and I appreciate all the fans out there who love this stuff. And trust me, I'm a fan too. I can't wait to get my PS5. I haven't purchased it yet. Once I get that, We'll be playing a lot more Fallout and something else that might be coming out soon. I don't want to talk too much. Nice. Yeah, and speaking of the audiobooks, Keith, I'd almost rather hear you uh, read the Stephen King than Stephen King. It, it, uh, it's so comfortable. Fits you like a shoe. It's great. I, 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 I've worked with Stephen King. He's a very sweet man, but he's neither a good screenwriter nor a good actor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. You didn't like him in Creepshow? Oh, Jordy. Come on, Jordy. Hey. Creepshow was hilarious. <laughs> Keith, what was the Dean Koontz series you did? Oh, yeah. That was uh, Firestarter, uh, was it? Moonlight Bay. That was Moonlight beautiful, Bay, the, yeah. Uh, Christopher Snow series. Seize yeah. the Night? Great, was it great Seize work. the Night? Great work. I, I enjoyed that whole series. Great work. Mm -hmm. I think we've... I, I think, was in Vegas there. about a couple months ago. At a, at a, go ahead. What, what, I was going to say you froze there for a second. You're okay. Saying I think what? Am I... You're freezing, you're freezing. Yeah, it's doing that you, weird thing again. You were for a second, but uh, you know we're getting a couple of words, and the ones we are <laughs> getting are lovely. <laughs> oh, I'm going to go off and come back on. Sounds right. okay. good. We'll okay. see in a second. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Paula Tiso. Well, hello there, everybody. I'm Paula Tiso. Hey, Paula. <laughs> I work in a lot of different areas. Oh, first of all, yes, I am honored to be here. And this is my pleasure to be here having fun for funds. And I yeah. hope everybody does donate what they can. It's a very important cause. So thank you for having me. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank um, you. Of course. I couldn't say no. Um, I work in many different areas of voiceover video game not being the only one. So I'm not maybe, well, I do have a lot of credits because I've been doing this a long time. So what I'm gonna do is just say that um, Duchess did start out, that's my character in Fallout 76. She did start out as a holotape and uh, she was so fantastic. They had to bring her back. And I did so many sessions as Duchess. It was one of my favorite characters ever to voice. She that's... really was fun. She's a lot of fun. And she's a lot like me. You know, I do have my friend, um, Saul, the zombie sitting down at the end of, uh, well, he's over there, right? Now. Yeah. You know, we just, it's something I wanted to recreate for myself. Um, other characters that I have voiced in the past, um, Sylvia Christel from No More Heroes. Uh, no More Heroes 1, 2, and 3. She's a fabulous character, very much into her self-care while she's booking death fights for Travis. Um, Orochi and Fire Emblem. And uh, another favorite is Laughing Octopus. I did her years ago for Metal Gear. So That's awesome. She was a fantastic and challenging character because I had to match the voice um, of the actor who had done it before me. And he was a Fred Tattashore. He's giant compared to me as far as his chest and the air that he could take in and I had to do the same breaths when I did mm. Laughing Octopus and Match because I was beauty he was beast it was great and then Lulu from Final Fantasy 10 it's uh, one of my characters that I loved and had done years ago so thank you so much for having me and I'm glad to be part of this fabulous crew grateful to have you here yeah thank you for being here and uh, Alex just joined us as well Although we can't, there's yeah, Alex. Sorry. There's hey, Alex. Alex. What's up? Wait a minute. I think that uh, that's actually Keith wearing an Alex disguise. He disappeared and suddenly Alex showed up. Oh, here comes Keith. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's what happened. <laughs> Have you been, Alex? 
Oh, super good. I can't stay though, guys. I just popped in to say hi. I have to go back to work. I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. We're glad to have you drop in and help us. It, it, you want to say anything about uh, people donating? I mean, Alex took all the time to come out here and say hello to you folks. The least we can do is have you donate just a little bit to uh, ALZ. Yeah, just a little bit, guys. <laughs> We're I helping people. Nobody sounds more like their character in natural speaking voice than Alex Maybe. does as Rose. <laughs> She's my bad alter ego. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's okay. So, uh, Keith, uh, we have now established since you are both appearing here that you guys aren't each other in disguise. So there we have it. <laughs> okay. Well, am I actually in the thing again? Yep, you're good. Okay, great. And uh, Neil Kaplan also joining us the man the myth the legend nope just me <laughs> <laughs> how are you neil i'm all right i'm all right thank you uh <clears throat> just uh in the middle of a very busy traveling summer um one of the one of the anime that i worked on a few years back got very popular during lockdown and I'm uh, happily hitting the road and uh, uh, meeting a lot of the fans in person mask on, but uh, you know, we're, we're part way back. Yeah. It's amazing that people gobbled up so much content during the pandemic that now they've got to go out and create new. So it is creating new work and uh, we have to recreate and, and give new chapters of things uh, that sometimes things that we thought we were done with and over with. And then once people start consuming them in mass again, it becomes popular. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I work on something a few years back and I know it's coming back and I keep having fans asking me if I'm coming back to it. It's, I have to kind of explain the business to them that first there's got to be an offer. Yeah. An offer is there's important, gotta, right? Yeah, There's got to be an invitation to come back before I can say whether or not I'm going to be coming back. Voice actors are kind of like vampires that way. We have to be invited in. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I don't know. I think that that works with face people too. Yeah, yeah. Any any kind of acting, really. Uh, any anything that you do, and and we do enjoy being invited in. And we only we don't take all the blood, just a little bit, just enough to survive. Now, That's now I just gotta make sure of one thing because I jumped on here willingly, you know, to help out. But we're fighting against Alzheimer's, right? Yes. Oh, yes, yes we are. Just okay. to make it clear, we're fight. We do not like Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's okay. is the uh, enemy. I, we're know, fighting against it. It's well, have you been a part like of any pro Alzheimer's uh, fundraisers <laughs> recently? <laughs> not that I'm aware of, but I'm wondering. <laughs> you know, it's like it occurred to me a long time ago that if I was a smoker, which I'm not, but I might hang out in front of Seven Eleven, you know, saying raising money for cancer research cancer research <laughs> and then when i got my cigarette money i would go inside and buy my cigarettes and when somebody said hey i gave you money for cancer research i would say what do you think these are for pal you know so i'm just saying you know yeah, i don't encourage anybody to get it to research it we, we're researching for a cure and also you know basically providing help for people who are dealing with it and are the caretakers and uh, a place I for people totally to call and reach that. out yeah yeah, yeah i mean no, that's that I support. that's a huge thing yeah thank you thank you for that i mean the other way around no i would i would step right out of here and say goodbye if we were doing it the other way around but i think <laughs> we're doing it the right way yeah okay it's one of those four equals against right well we're for the alzheimer's association who is against Alzheimer's. Right. And we're also for the people who may have Alzheimer's and yes. are dealing with the ramifications. And we're for their families yeah, who absolutely. are working so hard to support those, those people that they love. So I just want to make sure yeah. who we're yeah, they're for. We're for them. I mean, there are millions of caretakers out there and there'll be like 11 million caretakers by 2030 for working for free. And that's what the Alzheimer's Association does. In fact, if anybody needs information about that, you can go to ALZ.org. And if you're outside of the country right now, anywhere outside of the United States, you can go to ALZ.org slash global. And what they do is they'll hook you up 
with people who can help you, people who have been through this, uh, uh, ideas of, of uh, memory care facilities that can help someone when you have them in your home, your family in your home, and sometimes you just you want to be there for them and care for them, but you know that they need something extra. And you can't always afford help. You can't always afford somebody to come in and do what needs to be done for you and done for your loved one. And the Alzheimer's Association is there to help hook you up with the right people and make that happen, which is why we're tossing in. So those other competing uh, charities right now that are raising money for Alzheimer's itself can go to blazes. We're against it. (laughs) And, and, let's, and let's how- be fair. And let's be fair. This is also a, a disease and a situation that can come on, you know, slowly. And yeah. we're not even sure that we're dealing with it. And then, as we're dealing with it, um, we can be overwhelmed with easily the people that we're helping and the yeah. questions that we have. Yep. So, just the mere fact that there are people out there who can answer some questions, who can help us transition from just being loving family members to being caretakers or vice versa transitioning from being a caretaker to just like you said realizing yeah that there may be more of it than we can actually do and that can be a very difficult realization for people so i'm glad that you're doing it yeah it can be overwhelming and it's overwhelmed and devastated entire families Uh, when you have somebody who you know and you love who suddenly their personality begins to change uh they start slipping they don't necessarily recognize anymore they can become combative Uh, being given the information being given the resources is part of that transition into being able to handle it because it is, it's a huge transition, a huge transition. Having gone through it with uh, my grandmother and then with my mother and watching my uncle going through it, my brother now, his uh, mother-in-law going through it. I have so many people out there. We have hundreds of gamers around the world right now doing streams for this and they're sharing their stories. People who are donating are sharing their stories and everybody, it's very personal. It's very, very personal. It touches you. And just know that the person you know and the person you love who you're watching slip away, they may not be able to retain their memories, but you do. You are the the you are the person who is the caretaker not only of their physical self, but of their memories and of who they really are. Don't let that be lost ever. Very well said. Beautiful said. Um, Carly had some questions that she was going to do to to get us all loosened up here a little bit. Okay, let's loosen back up. Sorry, go ahead. (laughs) So this is... uh, We are having fun for funds, yes. Carly, who uh, runs the Atomic Stop here on Twitch, um, also building Friendship Fridays, uh, streams quite a lot of Fallout 76. Just a a little. Just a little. Just live and breathe it almost every day. (laughs) Carly, you bring the hard questions. Let's go. All right. So, you know, everyone's got a weird talent. So uh, do you guys have, like, what's your most unusual talent? That we can actually talk about in public? (laughs) Preferably. I mean. (laughs) Okay, I'll start this off. Mine's with my tongue. Wait, what? What the hell is, what is is going on there? Did you just touch your own tongue with your tongue? I did. Folded it. Folded it. Oh. I have. That was unsettling. Oh okay, well, uh, that was a good one. Very unusual. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I've been told that, I mean, that's weird. Being able to do that kind of shape with your tongue is interesting, but I've been told that uh, some people, they can't curl their tongue. Some can't make it fatter. It, there are different muscles that some people just can't do. Their tongues don't always do the tricks. So- so is your tongue lacking something that it has this ability to fold like over like that? Like mm, no, I don't think I've ever been told that, but <laughs> that's one question down. Next up, Kitty Carlisle. Yes, no what's your tongue be. question? <laughs> uh, I mean, I've, I've never actually had it x-rayed. So <laughs> anybody else want to go? Yeah. Anybody have any talents that, you know, tongue or otherwise? Oh, I have no talents on the spot. <laughs> My tongue is long. I've got a long tongue. Like it, like a uh, a kiss, Gene Simmons kiss, long tongue. Oh, can you reach your brain? Oh, 
<laughs> That's not not as not as cool, but it is long. <laughs> Honestly, can't think of anything not like work related. That's what's so sad about this yeah! question. It's like yeah, I'm usually like, you're like, I can do a voice. That's my special talk. Yeah, it's right? a, I'm a one trick pony. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I was I was thinking in high school, this is really not impressive, but rubber pencil. Oh, uh, yeah, the classic yeah. rubber pencil. I, I haven't tried this in like a decade. Let's, Let's see go. how it goes. Rubber pencil? Oh, that's not bad. <laughs> that's, no, that's not bad. The frame rate keeping up? Yeah. Oh, it's rubber to me. Yeah, that's looking rubber. <laughs> Whoa, that's so trippy, and I'm sober. Oh. All right. Rubber. Which is really... <laughs> You blown away, Carly. You can't really oh, yeah. sit on the street corner with the rubber pencil and the tin cup and get a lot of donations, though. It doesn't work as well. Uh, maybe, maybe if I threaten people with the dull pencil, they'll. You'll get more money if you threaten yeah. them with the pointed end. Yeah. 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 So it is rubber. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> what about Neil, Paula, or Keith? What are your your special hidden talents? Uh, well, okay, I uh, garden. <laughs> which doesn't That's sound still a tell. too amazing. Green However, thumb. I will say that um, last summer I planted uh, bronze fennel and it became covered in first swallowtail caterpillars mm. that then went into the pupa stage and then they um, emerged as beautiful butterflies and then monarchs. So wow. I had a full-on butterfly garden going on wow in my backyard and uh, my studio uh, we are a sag after approved studio and we have other talent in occasionally when we you know we also have a whisper room so we can mm -hmm. use this whisper in there and um and i've had other talent come through and be amazed at my garden and my butterfly garden so there you go that's a little unusual cool. it's not like that's uh, awesome though. it's not like chip or it's not the right <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank God. <laughs> but it's beautiful and, it, and you know what? It helps the environment. So I am proud. Nice. 100%. I mean, mine I does nothing for the environment, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't keep a plant alive to save my own life. So that's amazing. <laughs> thank you. Oh my gosh, my garden is quite lovely. It's the it's my garden studio. You can sit out here and feel peaceful and all that. I'm feeling peaceful just thinking about all the butterflies and the foliage. So you know, and and I read an article, and I know it had everything to do with me, that the <laughs> monarch population is coming back because oh. it was it was in yeah, a I read state that article of decline too. because you know they mm -hmm. they migrate to Mexico and back. Yeah, and they drink <laughs> heavy tequila while they're down there, and it really thins out the population. But when they come <laughs> here, it's all water all the time, no tequila, and they were doing great. Yeah, just don't only drink bottled water when they're in Mexico or no ice, you know. Mm. Very... <laughs> oh no. Um, I uh, I don't know if this is weird or not, but I I've uh, I'm a cert I have an advanced certification as a scuba diver and I dove all around the Caribbean and California and North nice. Carolina. That's what I've are some of the cooler to. things you've seen? Uh I've <laughs> I don't know, you know, uh, Sharks. I was at a cave with the sleeping sharks off of uh, uh, Iso de Mujeres in uh, in the Yucatan, and uh, they they there's this these these rock ledges that these twelve to fifteen foot nurse sharks uh, lie on, and there's a current that goes through and it bubbles through their gills, and they can actually sleep. So it's not true that shark sharks never sleep. They never. So they lay. Sleep. You can tell they're sleeping because they're just laying down. Is it sort oh, yeah. of like a shark snore? You know they're lying. It's like a it's like a shark dorm. They're lying down in these ledges, you know, sixty to seventy feet of water off the Yucatan. You know, and I'm wow. sure it's like other places. That's they're mostly wild. nurse sharks there, but uh, fifty five percent of all uh, shark bites are are from uh, nurse sharks. Even though we think, oh, they're gentle, but if you grab someone by the tail and and you grab me by the by the foot and wake me up, I'm probably going to bite you too. <laughs> I almost punched that's forewarned is forearmed. What's mm -hmm. that, Jordan? You punch what? I almost punched that. I was I had a horrible problem of of staying up all night and gaming, and then to like four a.m. and then going to school and trying to like stay awake, which never happened. And I was falling asleep during uh, a history class, which this teacher was so old school. He was playing it on film reels, like. Bah! Oh, I remember that. Just <laughs> the sound of that just like puts you to sleep. Anyways, I'm falling asleep to one of those, and I'm like, you know, doing the usual like. 
Try this. And think he's behind, so I think I'm getting away with like falling asleep. And all of a sudden, I wake up, and his he he kind of had like he it was a caricature, man. He he was like very southern. He had these big old spectacles, and and I wake up, and he's literally this close to me, and I'm just like, I'm like. Ah, and I like pulled a fist back and I'm not a great like fighter at all. I almost punched my teacher. Just yeah, like that. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> just like that. That's a tower. Oh, balder. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, so it, it happens. How is that a talent though? No, no, I'm just going off keys. Grabbing my talent is I have moments of incandescent rage. <laughs> <laughs> right? Is that, is that you? Is that your secret, Neil? Are you always angry? Um. Well, I don't. Any, I don't think anybody would say that's so much of a secret. Um, <laughs> nah, my my secret and unusable skill is being able to do the voice of a group of ducks at the same time. Of course, they're all hypnotized, so they speak with one voice. Wait, so you know, it's, you know. <laughs> you may not proceed with the flag. You know that kind of thing. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> We're gonna need That's a young like, priest and an old priest Andy around Christmas time. To you know do a you know. That feels oh, like God, possessed God. Donald. Yeah, you know. that is. No, well, it's Donald and a chorus of other ducks. So <laughs> the power know. of Disney what? compels you. The power of Disney compels you. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> uh, oh, that's that's a, that's an amazing talent. It's awkward. I used to, I used to. <laughs> I, I, my, I used to draw a lot. I actually did a uh, daily comic strip for a couple of years in Washington, D.C. at uh, the Washington Times. It was a daily strip called Martini and Clyde, and I would write and draw it, and it took 26 hours a week, but I had a full-time job at the same time. Then I got married and had a kid, and I was trying to keep it going, and uh, one thing had to go eventually. But uh, uh, I, I discovered the, the, a weird thing about being able to cartoon and to draw is the same thing as if you have a pickup truck and all your friends want you to help move. Anytime someone wants something drawn, they reach out to you and ask you to start drawing it. And I had a, uh, uh, sister-in-law came to me one time and she was like, I need you to draw a couple pictures for my class. And I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. I'll do that. And I agreed to do it for her. And then I found out what she wanted was for me to draw a caricature of every member of the third grade class at her school, <laughs> which was something like 115 kids. And by the time I was done, it was like, I have burned the will to draw completely out of my soul. And I didn't draw for like a year or two after that. It was wow. like, I'm done. So wow. yeah, don't, don't tell anybody if you can draw. And uh, if you have a pickup truck, keep that stuff to yourself. Otherwise it's all like beer and pizza and helping people lift heavy things. <laughs> It's only your friends with Ikea furniture want you to do it, too. <laughs> That's really cool. Do you still draw now or did you get back into it? Yeah, I got back into it and I still cartoon and I still draw and I pass it on to uh, children who uh, go ahead and do that for themselves as well. So uh, it's it's kind of, you know, I don't know about you guys, but if you, you know, acting is storytelling to me. And I think storytelling can be done a number of different ways. I love to write and I cartoon and I, I uh, do stand up comedy and sketch comedy and improv and all sorts of things. Well, how the medium doesn't matter as much as getting out there and telling the story. If we were in the days of, say, Fallout lore, we would be traveling from town to town with a show and probably getting blown up or shot or killed by raiders. But we'd, <laughs> we'd still have to pursue our craft somehow. Carly, what else you got? All right. So um, you have 90 minutes to spend a spend one on one with anyone you've looked up to. Doesn't matter if they're still living or if they've already passed on uh, famous or not. Who would it be? Christopher Walken. Ooh. Christopher Walken. Yeah. yeah. Would you just be talking or would you be dancing too? I'd be walking. No. <laughs> Um, I think I would be, uh -huh. I just would be fascinated to see what that would be like. I think it'd be fun. Just popped into my brain when you said that, Carly, because it's like, who would that be? There's a lot of people actually, but I would say Christopher Walken would be really interesting. And I think maybe I'd want to dance with him. Mm. And why not? After seeing him in that music video, who was it? Not Daft. Oh, that was a great one. Um, I don't know. He did all the different, he would just dance through the whole thing. Right? Daft Boy Slim. 
Fat Boy Slim. That's that it. video is so great. Mm. I quite like, he had a great look in Batman Returns. Between the suit and the bow tie and the hair as Max Shrek. He was awesome in that movie. I just started off the first them. time in years and like I was like, whoa, that's an intense look. Yeah, it's a definite look. So uh, as far as for a quick Chris, quick Chris Walken story, I used to do Chris Walken on the radio and sports radio. <laughs> Very hacky, but I used to do him for like six or seven years straight in all sports radio because Chris Walken, when we did him, was an expert on picking March Madness. So he would know, <laughs> you'd be, he'd know which teams were, you know, uh, we're going to, we're going to come out of the East or whatever the, like that. The five seed was going to beat, was going to beat the, uh, was going to beat the 12 or something or whatever the case may be. So he was, uh, an expert in that stuff, which was fun. And so it would, we would improv the crap out of it. It was a blast. It was fun. Sounds great. What about, uh, what about Neil? Uh, the screen was freezing up during the question, so I kind of missed it. Oh, Carly, uh, yeah. Um, so if you had 90 minutes to spend one-on-one -on -one with anyone, whether they, you know, were still alive or famous, if it's someone you looked up to, well, who would it be? <laughs> it's a tough question. <laughs> yeah, well, my first thought was, uh, I lost her when I was 19, so I'd have to say my mother. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, everybody's yeah. response is going to be shallow. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, it's like. No, it just made me look you know. real bad. No, no. I mean, there, there are lots of, lots of people. I'd, I'd, love to, I'd, love to, I'd love to talk to anybody who was on your, your show of shows. I mean, for crying yeah. out loud. Oh, I wow. Could, I yeah. Could, I could spend 90 minutes talking to Sid Caesar. I could spend 90 oh, minutes Sid talking Caesar. to Neil Simon. Hey, why not Carl spend 90 Reiner. minutes talking to, to Mel Brooks, who's still around at this point? I take, you know, Absolutely. Mel Brooks would be a, a blast. And Mel Brooks has got it going on, man. He still has it going on. Hopefully. Still waiting yeah. on Spaceballs, too, with the search for more money. <laughs> Keith, what do you think? I, 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 want to spend time with Abraham Lincoln. And then I tell him not to go to the theater. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody not, ever takes worry. good advice, though, Keith. They never do. No, especially if they ask you, like, what was the how, was that play any good? And you go, uh, it wasn't that good. <laughs> the finish is explosive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's has explosive. enough has enough time passed for that to be? Yeah, I guess it has. <laughs> well. You know, so there's the it's it's a, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? Yeah. <laughs> oh man. I've used that in a I've used that in a play. <laughs> I've actually put it in a play. Yeah. Chip, did you have anybody? Well, actually, my first thought was my mother too, and uh, I lost her when I was 21, mm -hmm. and um, and then uh, and then I started thinking about our time together, and I decided on my grandmother. So, um, but, you know, as far as famous people go, I would say, uh, maybe Gene Wilder. Oh yeah. Be, oh yeah. Be a good one. So, you know, on a Gene Wilder front, I gotta, I gotta say, um, I did it. My first convention that I did overseas, I had a free day froze up. about to go yeah, to the tower of London. And then I looked in a local paper and saw Gene Wilder was going to be at Waterstones signing his autobiography. Wow. And I sacrificed spending a day in London, happily, happily, and sat in line and read halfway through the autobiography while waiting in line. And there are pictures of me getting it signed by Gene, and I'm just nerding out completely. That is awesome. Yeah. Wow. So I was like, anytime anybody ever meets me at a convention and, and apologizes for nerding out, First of all, I never understand it because it's just me, you know, but then, you know, it's like I, I want to treat that moment always with respect because I remember being that person on the yeah. other side of the table. And, you know, it, G, I hear the name Gene Wilder and it just makes me happy. And, and I remember, you know, this quiet, humble man 
you know, very unassuming. And then you open up his book and read these amazing, absolutely mind-blowingly amazing stories and the yeah. life he must have lived. So I think that's a kudos on that selection. I think there's nothing. Have- there's nothing you can say in that moment that you feel will touch anything that you really want to reach them with. I, I know when I had a chance to interview George Carlin once, I never felt stupider. Every question that came out of my mouth sounded to me like, I said, you've ever done this or that. Day. I felt <laughs> my IQ just drop right through the floor. And, and, and I didn't want that. I wanted to sit there and have a cool, calm you know, intelligent conversation with George Carlin. And I, for some reason, even though I've never been starstruck around people with him, I felt like an idiot fanboy. It just happens. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great question too. Has, uh, has anyone else had uh, someone that you've met that you've been legitimately starstruck by? Alex is nodding her head. (laughs) Oh yeah, for sure. you guys know him. I, I, the first time I met Steve Bloom, I nearly like lost my shit. <laughs> if that literally happened, it would have been memorable for him too. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were, I was at work and uh, I got to meet him. He walked in and it made me, you know, go ah. But I tried to keep it. <laughs> And he took a picture with me, though, where he like and he went and grabbed some like pins and stuff from like office supplies. And he put them as like, you know, the Wolverine claws. That's and awesome. then I was like, hold on, I got to do that, too. So I went and got some. And- that is an old Steve Bloom trick for stealing office supplies. They go right into the pockets when he's done. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool. <laughs> what about anybody else? Jordan, I, I thought I saw your hand there. The star question. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, I would. <laughs> so I've I've only been in LA for like it's been five years. So that's been a while. But it was like one or two years in. We're in Burbank daytime, like Sunday or something at four p.m. or two p.m. So it's not like a late night bar situation. I'm waiting at a bar. It's busy, and um, and I'm just waiting to actually get my like get the check for the, ta- the food we have at the table. So I'm not in a rush, but I figure other people who want drinks might be. So I've been waiting for five, 10 minutes. And I notice just in my periphery, a blonde person, right? Just like on the right side of me. And a few more minutes pass and I figured, uh, let me just, you know, be, be, let me ask whoever this is who I haven't looked at yet, <laughs> if, if they're just getting their check, otherwise they don't, they're not in a rush or if they're trying to get drinks, I'll just let them go ahead of me because it, it's annoying to wait forever to get drinks. So as I'm turning my head, my question was, are you waiting to get drinks or, or pay your check or something? And as I'm turning, I'm like, are you waiting to get drink or pay your check? And it is Kirsten Dunst, who, <laughs> who I like crushed hard on, like, anyway, that was gross. Hard on. Um, didn't mean it that way. I crushed really. <laughs> wow. Whoa. Hey. hey. That. Hey, no. That. <laughs> hey, wow. Wow. Okay, I'm gonna hey, hold the wow. boom arm now. What is not... going on here? <laughs> the timing of that. This is how I looked when I met her. That yeah. is perfection. I hit my desk Holy then... crap! <laughs> if so your conversation weird. was interrupted by the sound of springing hydraulics, I could see how that could be oh, off. Shit. I'm gonna hold it. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> that's pretty much the end of the story. Um, <laughs> because yeah, this is how I acted. I I didn't even say like, oh, Kirsten, hi. I just couldn't even. Uh, like in my head, I'm like, is that Kirsten? Dunn? It's because I couldn't even ma- maintain eye contact. And then she's just like, I'm getting drinks. And I'm like, oh, cool. You, you can go ahead. <laughs> and that was it. And then I walked away and I like looked back one more time. I'm like, that's Kirsten Dunst, which is just like she was my biggest crush as a teenager. So that was that was wild. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, I still can't believe the mic thing. I'm going to hold it for the next <laughs> <time>. <laughs> oh, yeah. It has and betrayed actually- you. She's actually married to Jesse Plemons, I think, right? She's married. They're they're married. Yeah. And they've been in a couple of things together. I think they met on Fargo. Oh, cool. Fargo. All right. Yeah. So Jordan, is that microphone you're using? Is that the 40 and 416 or what is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the new model. Straight out of Germany. <laughs> yep. Stay. Keith, what about you? Was there anybody that you were really starstruck by? Well, uh, back when I was a young lad, I was in a theater company, the organic theater company in Chicago. And uh, we did all sorts of adaptations and new plays that we wrote. But um, 
we did an adaptation of Sirens of Titan uh, by Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Oh. And um, I played, I was one of the people that helped adapt it. And I also played a bunch of parts in it, one of which was I played Kazak the dog. It was a big 200 pound mastiff. And um, at first when Stuart Gordon asked me to, who directed it, wanted me to play the dog, I thought, fuck you, Stuart. You know, <laughs> <laughs> And um, and then and then I came and watched the rehearsal and I watched one of the other actors go, I know, I, I figure out what I want to do. And I did it. I was basically nude, you know, except for a dance belt and I had floppy ears and I painted my face. And I, <laughs> Wait, and, what? And, I, what? and uh, so I'm sitting there. We had this big party with Kurt Vonnegut came to the uh, to the uh, um, uh, to the to an open to the premiere of it, you know, and um he, he he I say he sat in the in the in our patrons you know home and it was a big party and I'm sitting there at his feet you know like a little acolyte and uh, and I kept waiting for him to ask me you know like well what was it like adapting it you know how did you feel with well, these issues he goes so he just looks at me and I'm sitting right next to this girl I started dating and he goes so you getting much play out of the dog oh, <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, oh man. <laughs> Uh, Vonnegut. I love Vonnegut stuff. Yeah, me too. Yeah, he was he was a nice guy, you know, and stuff's pretty funny, pretty theatrical too. They actually did a another. They did a a, a recent production of that same thing at uh, at Sacred Fools. I think it was you know like two or three years ago. Has anyone else here done uh, done stage work on theater? Yeah, yeah. Sacred yeah. Fools. I, I bet when I lived in LA, we did a couple things there. Nice. <laughs> Outstanding. That's a fun theater, man. Fun, fun, fun concept. You know, I don't know if anybody, if you guys are aware of like sacred foods, it's a, it's a, it's a competition. Basically every, every week you've got how many Keith, probably six or. They used or to have five. a late, they used to have a late night show, you know, that they would, uh, that they would do. Uh, that's what I know of it, you know. Yeah. Um, it was on the weekend, and, but they had like, you know, usually six, maybe six sketches that were, you know, anywhere between like three and 10 minutes. It was a, comp it was a competition. They would then winnow them down. They get voted out, you know, which yeah. um, I was kind of against, I'll be honest with you, you know, because yeah. I, I don't believe it could be a competition, you know, but I, I get what you're saying. We did a late night soap at, uh, at EST when I was first artistic director there back in 2015. And it was called In Search of, uh, In Search of, uh, In Search of, uh, In Search of Dog. Because uh, the lead uh, uh, the lead uh, character was dyslexic, so it was really in search uh -huh. of God. But it was pretty funny. Okay. Three episodes, you know, it was was hard. <laughs> Late night in front of audiences, we would write them and then on Tuesday and rehearse them and then put them up on on Saturday. And it's a bit of a thrill, though. That's a bit of a thrill. Were yeah, the crowds cool. good for it? Yeah, uh, they they grew. They grew. You know, yeah, they grew. And they grew at Sacred Fools too. I know some of our writers had stuff there you know um but uh, it came out of actually I, I i did the original late night um sort of soap opera at uh cucaracha theater in in in, um, in in new york and it was really i played a serial killer of course you know but um, <laughs> of course it, it, it was uh, and my then uh my then fiance uh would, was walking around in her underwear constantly so it was pretty fun and it started out when we first did it uh, uh we, when we first did it, uh, we would had we had more people on stage because there were six or seven storylines than, than than there were in the audience. But by the end of the year, we had to move to a different space because 800 people were coming at 1030 on a Saturday night to watch it. So it was really kind of fun. You know, it was a great, great event. And anyway, sorry. No, that's awesome. no, that's great. <laughs> we used to do uh, the sketch comedy uh, things at a place called DC Space. And that was back where we would open the evenings and the weekends up and then after us would the bands would come on we have like the proto-punk bands we'd have like black flag with rollins and we'd have uh uh root boy slim and people like that come on so uh this it could be very street it could be very uh edgy and the comedy was was a bit like that as well and of course the neighborhood we're in i'll never forget one night we're up there uh we'd have guests come in and be you know guest comedians i think pat Oswalt was with us one night we had a whole bunch of other folks but this night a girl named kara russell was on stage doing the uh, guest routine when some guy with tribal tattoos on his face and no shirt comes walking into this uh this place and and of course everybody's sitting there eating their dinner coming in from the suburbs uh relaxing and enjoying the show suddenly see this guy 
hyperventilating, coming through, staring at everybody in slow motion, just looking at them. And she's trying to play them off. Oh, there's my ex-boyfriend trying to get last, but nobody's laughing. They're terrified. And the guy <laughs> makes his way all the way through, gets the back door about to leave, stops, turns and looks back. And they all he and he eventually left, comes back that night and starts breaking instruments of the band on stage. The police are called. Police won't do anything because we're downtown. This is D.C. space. This is punk rock, punk rock and roll. This is a meatball comedy. This is, you know, they're not worried about us. So the next day he went down to second story books in town and took hostages. And then they paid attention. But uh, uh, that is the kind of edgy, wonderful audience that I miss performing in front of to this day. Oh, my God. The hell? <laughs> That's a little over the edge. Yeah, That's just a, a little bit, bit over the edge. Yeah. Yeah, who gets the tribal tattoos on their face? I mean, when the, the moment you start saying, uh, I mean, tattoos are one thing, but when you go, fill the face, there are issues that are, the, the tattoos just aren't going to cover. <laughs> yeah. Carly. Oh, my goodness. All right. So let's see. So which character in anything you've ever played would be most likely to survive? and thrive in a post-apocalyptic wasteland. Hmm. Well, case hmm. deck, the dog that I played that I was naked on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely the dog. <laughs> would, it, would it be somebody, have to be somebody from afar or any game that you do? Anything. Yep, anything at all. I think Shea Gorith, the Daedric Prince of Madness, would only <laughs> thrive. He'd enjoy it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> While you guys well, are thinking about that, oh, sorry, that? go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to say we we have a a one hundred dollar donation proposition from Ricky okay. Renee in chat. Uh, she has a request for Chip Jocelyn actually, um, Ooh, and is willing to make a hundred dollar donation. If All Chip, right. if Chip I, says, I, I will, I will match it. <laughs> Does Chip have to wear the Wait, same what? outfit Keith Dig playing the dog? Is that what what this is about? Oh no. <laughs> oh. Uh, in the voice of Graham, say Graham like meat. Graham really like roast beef. <laughs> Graham like meat. Graham really like roast beef. <laughs> hey, there you go. <laughs> All right. That's, I think you gave one hundred twenty-five dollars worth right there. That was that was <laughs> that was matching. I'll, I'll match up to hundred. Yeah. So you got 200 bucks on that one. Oh, geez. Thank you. That's. And uh, also I missed. Uh, thank you, Rachel and Demost for your donations as well. Thank you so much. We're at. Uh, thank you very much. All. That's wonderful. We're at 22,172.67. Wreck it. Renee Fantastic. rocks too, by the way. That she does. Yes, she does. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wreck it. Renee. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I'm blown away by the response to people uh, with the donations. It's really, really cool. And uh, you guys leaving me speechless sometimes, which is hard to do. Anybody else with uh, a character that you think would survive and thrive well? I think I'll, I'll say uh, I, I played a, a private Kyle Richards from um, Fallout uh, New Vegas. And the reason why he would survive is at the, at the time, he was the only ghoul that did not have a ghoul voice. So he was able to uh, communicate normally with uh, with anybody he, he he came across. So he could still maybe have that that layer of like, you know, don't kill me right away. Um, I'm actually speaking normally. Um, and, you know, it might have only be 30 more seconds before you blow his head off. But maybe not. Maybe he actually can survive in a post post apocalyptic world where you can have real conversations with real people and break it down. Smooth voice for smooth skins. Yes, man. <laughs> I I would say the Erididact, you know, from uh, um, from Halo Four, but he got killed, so I can't say that. Uh, but you know who would? <laughs> but you know who would survive? Is Russ Man from Call of Duty Nine? Yes, That's Russ Man. I've been killing all the deadheads out there, <laughs> one at a time. The deadheads would blow their balls off. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh what about you jordan what do you think uh i'm 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 literally like scrolling through characters i'm like dead died dead, really <laughs> dead ran over shot um those are that's the that's the fun part uh everyone if you ever want to get into voiceover 
yeah. is dying 300 times without losing your mm-hmm. voice. That's a skill you have to develop. It's hard. Yeah. You know, Those like efforts. Your, mm-hmm. your kneecaps you are getting in- busted off. Now a needle is being threaded through your eye socket. Go. It's just like, you know, so. Uh, <laughs> what was that, that again? That, it, <laughs> the worst effort ever. okay I, yeah i want to make sure we got that <laughs> i intentionally will give like bad effort sometimes just to break the state not like to ruin the flow but just like if i, if I know the director and they'll be like they'll say something and i'll just be like ah! yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just just to like throw them off their game anyway. so are all your characters are you basically the new sean bean does every one of your characters die uh, no i actually look I, I found one that's a god um it's ludociel <laughs> in the seven deadly sins anime series so he like I think he almost, I, shit, I don't know. I don't want to spoil anything, but he pretty much like comes and creates an Armageddon. And from what I understand. So I think it would be Ludosia. He he's, he's God, like one of the, one of the many gods and uh, he's pretty damn powerful. So we'll go with him. Neil, uh, is there anyone you could think of any character you've done? I feel like Emperor Zarkon would do really well in the apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> he would do good. Too. I, I don't think he would have any problems with Sun. That's awesome. The um, switching. Paula, time. we we haven't heard from Paula. What what characters oh, yeah. would survive, Paula? Well, I do think that most of my characters they like their self care and their beauty products. <laughs> um so i'd have to go with duchess i mean she's the one not that she doesn't you know she takes good care of herself too but she's you know she's more on top of everything else that has to go on around the wayward so i'd say duchess she's just cut out for the job yeah she's pretty rough and tumble she knows she knows her way around the wasteland she oh yeah what about uh, switching topics a little bit? Um, talking about voice acting, how how did you all get started in in either acting or voice acting? Um, why don't we start off with uh, with Neil? Uh, I just always did voices. You know, um, I grew up um, watching a, a TV show before. Uh, Saturday Night Live called The Copycats. And mm-hmm. it was um, Fred Travelina and um, uh, Frank Gorshin, uh, Marilyn Michaels, and the Impressionists of the day. So they didn't have all the makeup and everything. And I just kind of started from there, you know, and did theater as a kid and everything I did. Always had a, a voice. It was just always different. It was like, well, I... I do this stuff. Let me use it. And, you know, I even during a fundraiser had the good fortune of meeting Mel Blanc. He told me impressions of a hax kid, original characters. And that's pretty much the time that I transitioned from being a, you know, a 16 year old impressionist to just a guy who did lots of voices and dialects and stuff. Wow. I studied musical theater in New York City, but had the opportunity to do some uh, drop-ins for CBS FM. And as soon as I got behind the mic, I was like, I'm home where I'm supposed to be. So that's uh, just, I mean, uh, I'm still pursuing it. I'm still trying to break in, you know, 35 years later, I'm, you know, every day feels like I'm, I'm still trying to push the door open. Well, nobody's ever really made it, have they? I mean, we still, no matter what, no matter how many successes think, you I have. Think, I think I think Rob Paulson and Frank Welker have made it. I think I think <laughs> yeah. I think Frank Welker, having played Freddy and Scooby Doo since 1969, I'm thinking he might be able to kick back and say, "I think I've made it," <laughs> but he probably doesn't. He's probably right, too I busy. Think I, I, I think that the thing that's interesting, the people that you mentioned there, Neil, and and everybody included, is that, yeah, every day is a discovery and every day is new and we don't know what's going to challenge us next. But mm-hmm. it's that the joy of that and well, always being up for the challenge that gets us. One of the thing going. I tell people is, you know, because I went to I studied musical theater, so I went to school with dancers 
And I can't imagine what it might be like to, I mean, I can wake up every day. I can go months and months without work, but I can still wake up every day believing, honestly, that there's a good shot that the best days are yet to come. You know, that is the nice thing about doing voice work. And it is the nice thing about Frank playing Freddy since 69 is it doesn't matter that he couldn't do it on camera. We, you know, our, our art is a wonderful thing. And it also works with so many other developments in technology. Who would have thought when you and I were younger, Paula, that, that they would be streaming cartoons or how many thousands of TV shows we talk about that aren't really on TV anymore? Mm. You know, it's this whole whatever happened thing. to Saturday morning cartoons. They're they're not the same. God, I miss that. Yeah. It's so weird not having cartoons on Saturday. Uh, Wes, you probably even remember the Friday nights. Mm -hmm. You know, during the 70s when they would have the Friday night preview show and they would yeah. like preview all of their big Saturday morning cartoons like the Friday night beforehand. It was and amazing. Was such, there was, was nothing like deal being a kid with a big bowl of cereal and sitting there watching the Saturday morning cartoons, get a cereal bowl about the size of your head and sit there and just eat that while you're watching every cartoon that rolls by. That was beautiful. And uh, I mean, there, you can find cartoons 24 seven now, depending upon where you look. Which is, which is beautiful, the good but ones. also <laughs> no, the, the, uh, at this point, there's so many channels that even the good ones are playing 24 yeah, seven. You can find you them. Just got you just gotta find him exactly. It hey, you were like... talking about Mel Blank, and uh, oh, yeah. that you met him was amazing. I mean, most everybody just loves Mel Blank. I actually, when I was doing a video game voice acting class, I wanted to show some of the uh, students the Mel Blank's autobiography, which I loved. So I ordered one. I, I didn't have a reading copy because I think I loaned mine to somebody and they never gave it back to me. And so I went online and I picked up a copy of his book, which is uh, That's Not All Folks, which is a great uh, depiction of everything, talking about how he got into the business, talking about how he approached characters. It was wonderful. And I got it for $4.25 on Amazon because they said somebody had written in the book. And then I got it to my house and I found out who had written in the book. <laughs> that so was when like are you changing your name to Phil. I, I, he can call me Phil. He can call me anything he wants, you know, and I've had friends named Phil going, oh, hey, thanks for getting that book for me, Wes. I'm like, nah, nice try. <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> now, have you ever been out to make the pilgrimage to his um, grave site there in Hollywood? It says, that's all, folks, right on the top of the, the headstone there. And I was doing a sketch comedy show in town and somebody gave me this rose this white rose, one single white rose. And I took it back to my room where I was at. And I thought, what am I going to do with this? And I thought, I'm going to take, I'm going to go down and take it to Mel Blank. So I took it down and, you know, dropped the stone there on his uh, headstone. And then I put the rose there and I just took a moment and I thought about it. And I, I just started talking to him and, and thanked him for everything that he'd done and what he meant to me. And I said, I wonder if you were here today, what, what you might say to me. And just at that moment outside the cemetery, which is surrounded by these large, like 12 foot hedges all around, I heard a novelty car horn go off and go right at that moment, all the flesh just goose pimpled up my arm. And I'm like, okay, great. Thanks, Mel. Nice talking to you. Take care. Bye. Gotta go. You know? <laughs> so the timing was as perfect as Jordan's microphone malfunction. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, but, you know, I'd like to think that in some small way that was Mel Blank talking to me, but he talked to me all throughout my childhood. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure if he could have talked to you in that moment, Wes, you would have said, get off my chest. Yeah. <laughs> no, everybody says they want to talk to the people who have passed, but then they come to visit and you never stop screaming. It's very confusing <laughs> for them. Yeah. Oh, God. What about you, Paula? How did you get started? Well, hey guys, I think I have to go off and come back on because I got I'm I'm my ski, screen keeps freezing up. Yeah, no so worries, I'm Keith. Okay. Come, go leave and come. Okay. I have a Not bad that I don't computer. want to hear what you have to say, Paul. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a background in theater. Um, I feel like a lot of people I know have a background in either theater or they have a background in radio, depending on what area 
they kind of go in to after that. But anyway, background in theater, uh, eventually moved to Los Angeles. And um, after a year and a half, I decided to take a little time off from sketch comedy and work in kind of survival jobs. And I got a job at SBV and uh, ended up being a booth director and um, assisting all the agents in the room and working with all that fabulous talent re-inspired me to jump back into the game. So I was training with uh, Chris Zimmerman and Charlie Adler and- Cool. And from there, uh, I got back into sketch comedy. I'm gonna get to the point in a second. And um, was doing some shows around town, and my Rita Venori was out to lunch with a producer from CBS who had been to my show the night before and said, "Hey, you got to sign this this chick I just saw at the sketch comedy. She does all these voices. Her name's Paula Tiso." So when she came back from lunch, I was in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> called me into her office, and I got a, a talking to. But long story short, she really was being supportive. And in the end, she did sign me when I left. So that was that. And Good. that's how I got started. That was a while ago. Hey, you got to make a little noise every once in a while. Exactly. Or they don't pay any attention to you. That's right. Do what you got to do. Follow your heart. Do what you love. Mm hmm and What about you, Jordan? Uh, it's one of those, like, typical stories where it's like, Wow, everyone's telling me I have a nice voice. I should do voice. Over here. <laughs> so, but it, to make it a little more interesting, I worked um, like the graveyard shift at Dish Network tech support. So I was on the phone a lot. And so I was, my shift was 5 30 p.m., kind of graveyard to 2 30. That was you? That was me. <laughs> Wes is like, you bastard. Yeah, I canceled your account, Wes. You were very verbally abusive to me. And I didn't appreciate that. It was meant and fun. <laughs> hey, all you had to do was pay your bill. All those boxing matches you ordered, they add up. It wasn't me. That was the dog. The dog oh. ordered those. Yeah. <laughs> PPV. The, um, but it was in particular, it was older, lovely elderly women um, who would call in and they were up late, man. They were like, it was always, it was, you think it'd be like weird, crazy, or just like drunk people. I don't know, like calling in at 1 a.m. on a Monday. But it wasn't. It was usually like older ladies who had insomnia, I guess. I don't know. But, you know, after I'd fix their whatever, check something on their bill, you know, at the end, you ask, is there anything else I can help you with today, ma'am? And they'd be like, oh, no, not nothing at all. What was your name again? I'm like, is Jordan? Like, Jordan, you have such a nice voice. You, you should get into radio. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> uh, Thanks. Maybe I should. <laughs> you know, so they had a whole um, club, man. They'd light candles. They put on some Marvin Gaye and they give you a call. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so so it was just it was always in my mind. But I come from a really musical family um, and I did I, I impersonated like Simpsons characters when I was a kid. And my sisters would always make me do it. And I would impersonate teachers in high school and get in trouble. So they would leave the room and be like, oh, hi, everyone. Oh, Mr. Sperry here. Today you need to turn to page 314. <laughs> you know, I was I was kind of a class clown, but yet not popular. It was a weird. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I did not feel popular at all, but I can make people laugh. So that's so all that culminated. And then I eventually pursued it and realized when I took a class, I, I was raised in Colorado. And I took a class in Denver for voiceover and I was like, oh, you have to like have talent and know how to use this. It's not just about having where your voice resonates and sounds nice. You have to know how to use it. You have to know how to act. So the rest is history. I took a lot of improv, which really got me out of my kind of very, very quiet, scared, people pleasing shell. Um, and improv really changed my life. So mm -hmm. I, I took a ton in Denver and then once I moved to LA, I got access to more character work and the rest is history. So, and I, I work pro in all genres like, like Paula, commercial, promo, you know, video games, dubbing, anything but audiobooks. I don't know how you audiobook guys can do it. Like that is, that is the, I think that is the cream of the crop as far as how much stamina, how many accents you have to know, how long you have to record. It's just like, I don't know how you do it. It's, it's mind blowing how you audiobook narrators can do it. It's not <laughs> so for mad respect. Man, it's not for everybody. No, no, I, I have a feeling I'd like it though. That's what I'm scared about. Yeah, and I, I don't, I don't know. If you're doing it just you. yourself, Jordan, 
Uh, what? I mean, oh, I don't know like, how, how, how Chris does it, whether he works with a director or you work on your own, but uh, dude, if you're not working with a director, you'll go crazy. Sure. Yeah. I, I draw myself. Yeah, I don't like doing it alone. Yeah. It's no fun. The, I mean, the industry, I, I can't. It, it's changed. The industry has changed. So, you know, you're, if we think logically and uh, financially how the industry works, you know, we all have our rate that we'll, that we'll work for and we won't work under that, but, and certain companies will have that rate, but if you can direct yourself, you're going to be busier. It's just the way the world is right now. And if you're not going to direct yourself, you're going to be, you, you, you know, you can still work in the environment that you want. You won't not work, but you won't work as often. There won't be as many opportunities. It's just the way it has, it has. Yeah, but I can't, the, the I just, person. I, I don't know how you guys do it because you got to read the book five times. And I just don't well, have that kind of concentration. Who told you five times? Well, like, Once. Five times? Just the, Once. the sheer, the Once. sheer lot that. The sheer lot of me, when I do it, I have to pre-read it. Then I have to mark it because I have to mark all the different character voices. And then I've got to read it for money. So, Neil, and if Neil, I were directing I teach, myself. Like I, I teach, right? In one in, in one uh, meeting with you, right? Uh, you would be able to, you'd know what you were doing. And like in an well, hour, you'd be like, that, oh, okay. All right. Now that okay. I know how to pronounce your name, your last name accurately, Mr. Shula, <laughs> um, after all these years of reading it, uh, perhaps we will talk because the idea, because I always tell people, look, if you've got to direct yourself, you not only have to pre-read it and then read it, then you've got to reread it. And when you're rereading it, you can't let your eyes wander. You uh, I guarantee do it. And, and Keith will say the same thing. Someone like you who is worldly and good and understands storytelling right once you did one book like one legit really like I, i've book, done like 13 method, you would be like okay i know what i'm doing this is like you'd be able to grab any book and be able to translate it you know it is but everyone the more it's like it is like riding a bike in, in a certain way where the more you do it the more you learn yeah. in your own workflow what you need for prepping like so in that first time you go through it that's when you're marking up the script so you're only going through it once before you narrate it only right. once and then we're and then we narrate on the day you know and then you and then you know i don't even bother to mark it up anymore i used to you know with detailed markings but now <laughs> he just it. walks in like sunglasses right, prosecco right, right. he's like let's do this thing <laughs> I mean, well, he's, I good. he's good. Say, it's because he's good. He's, he's he's replaced me on series. I can tell you that. And he, so he's because he's good. You could go in, you do it. Some people have that. They just have it. That's you just awesome. grab a book and you're going to read it. And then just, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. He's ready to go. Me, I'm the, I'm more the, I'm the jackhammer. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not a a savant. So I have to, you know, I do, I I, I work hard at the stuff that I do. But it's one pass. One pass and then and then self direction. You do. We're doing it every day in all the all the stuff that we're doing on our auditions. If I so, didn't know that whole last paragraph was about reading books, it would have sounded filthy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I just want to say about Chris's class. I took a a workshop with Chris. And it's amazing and it will really clarify so many things. And I love, I love the art form and I, I think I would really enjoy doing it, but it is the, the long form of long forms. I do TV narration and that's long form, but that's fricking short form compared to a book. So I just got to say, Chris is an excellent teacher. And I'm if you're thinking of doing this, you're 400 is approaching. Uh, uh, and it's, you know, and I have uh, like, so I have MS. I, I, I learned I had MS at the end of 2020. Uh, uh, wow. And so um, things have like, for me, the, the, the number of books that keeps on going up and mm -hmm. I don't necessarily want that anymore. So that's why we've created a company where now I'm hopefully have a, a production manager and a production management team that's handling 40 and I'm only doing 40 a year or so where that's, that's much more manageable, healthy, not sitting in a chair for eight, eight hours a day in like this crunched up position. And, you know, right now I'm in PT for my hip. So, you know, we all want to just have, have balance, but, but thank you, Paula, for that. I appreciate you. Absolutely. A, giving, a, giving a plug. Yeah, four of you here actually teach. I know Jordan does classes. Uh, Chris, uh, Paula, I believe you do too, right? Yeah. 
And then West us, yeah. Yeah, and I'm a I'm a adjunct professor at Woodbury oh, University. Oh, I didn't know you knew that. Department. Yeah. Oh, and well, you've got okay. that whole professorial kind of uh, flair about you right now. Actually, I'm getting the feel of like uh, Donald Sutherland in Animal House. So okay. don't stand up. <laughs> yeah, don't. don't, don't <laughs> butt in the door. And I didn't, uh, Neil. Uh, Neil, what classes do you teach? Is it, oh no, is it voice acting? Yeah, um, I used to teach voice acting at the American Musical and Dramatic Academy in Hollywood. Oh, awesome. And I, I do some occasional teaching. And I am, in fact, one of Jordan's students. He just knows so much that it intimidates the living hell out of me. So, uh, uh, <laughs> You took one of Jordan's classes, really? No, I'm one of, I'm one of his lifetime people. I, I like, he, he, he did a little... This, you can get lifetime access to my brilliant audio <laughs> techniques. And I signed up for it because I had the extra cash at the time. And it's just more information than I can handle. You know, because uh, that was a great impression. One thing we have to remember. It sounded just like you. <laughs> sounded just like One you thing we have to remember is that what? this this whole universe is continuing to develop around us. And yeah. if us old people walk through it like we know everything. Mm. we're missing a lot and so when the younger talent comes up like jordan and they've learned all these different things that we didn't necessarily know he is a fountain of information when it comes to when it comes to home sound um development and in this day and age um i can't think of anything that's more important for an old guy like me to learn so thank wow. you, Jordan. Look at Jordan yeah. getting all those compliments. That's fantastic. Let's, I'll take you out to any steakhouse you want now, Neil. All right. <laughs> I mean, that means a lot. Thank you. Uh, Chris, uh, we heard a little bit of your story, but how did you get into it to begin with? Uh, I went to school to work in politics. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, I worked for Congress back in the late 90s and but while i was there i knew almost immediately that uh i don't like it here i don't like any of these people i don't uh, this is not going to be what i do for a living uh my family thought like this was because my grandfather was a, a common counselor and my uncle was a state rep and they thought oh chris is the next you know generation i'm like uh no uh i gotta go i gotta go right now so um <laughs> So my buddy suggested to me that I take an improv class. I took an improv class and that led to a sketch comedy um, audition, which um, I booked. And so then I was with a sketch comedy group called Perfect Monster. And we were like the first people to do sketch at, uh, at the Hong Kong up with, uh, with Rick, Rick Jenkins um, uh, in Harvard Square back in the late 90s. So we did shows all over Boston for a couple of years. And that set me up to... Um, the goal was to work on camera in Los Angeles because New York was dead anyway. And then 9-11 happened. So, um, you know, the plan was to get to get to L.A. I got to L.A. in 2002. And then when you get to L.A. and like your job is just find work, find work. Eventually you find voice if you've got a, a half decent instrument. So um, I did have the day where I went on three commercial auditions. They're like, oh, we, they all said, oh, we love your voice, you know. And the sad thing was, like, I thought that mattered. I thought that actually was like, oh, then I'm going to work everywhere immediately. Oh, yes. No. <laughs> so uh, I had some demos made. And then three years later, I got my first rep out there, probably in 06 or so. And then, you know, um, uh, Huck at, at the voice caster had a wonderful class um, back in the day. Um, uh, how do you pronounce his name? Was it Liggett or Liggett? Liggett? I think it's Liggett. Liggett. I think it's Liggett. So great guy. And I got him right before he retired. So like, uh, you know, he taught me a couple of concepts and that helped me along the way. And then, uh, like I said, the first video game booking that I had was because of the impressions of Fallout 3, uh, Fallout 3, um, doing, doing those, those, uh, uh, I think I booked maybe two small games, two, two double A's before I booked Fallout 3. And then, um, you know, it, and then I started to branch out into other forms of, of VO, and, um, but, but I don't, no one's mentioned like rep makes a big difference. You know, rep, we try to get as much work as, as we can on our own, but having good representation matters. Mm -hmm. So I was like this, you know, like a, a real roller coaster of having good rep and then getting dropped. And, and the, the funny thing was I learned a lesson. Um, 
while I was with a certain agency and they were doing workouts, I was like a proponent of VO work anyway. And I would suggest that friends of mine that I knew were good come in and read for the agent and, and, and start uh, working, you know, getting their reps and workouts and, and maybe the rep they'll, they'll get repped. Well, I had four friends that all like basically took a, a fourth of the things that I would be auditioning for. <laughs> and then, and then like, I'm like, hey, there, and then I ended up being, you know, left out. I was, I, I was on the side. And so that was a lesson learned. Like if, if you're reading on something, you know, maybe you want to not be, not be that guy today. Maybe, maybe it's like, be a little selfish, just a little bit in our industry here and there. It's hard to be selfish though. I like, you know, giving is, is what we want to want to be. We want to be part of a community. So after all that, I found, I found audiobooks in, in like 2011, I think in 2009, I was walking through like a, a Barnes and Noble and you see these like monolith things on the, on the shelf. They're like little monoliths. So I'm like, oh, what are these? And they were books on CD. And I'm like, books on CD? What are these? And it's a John Christian novel. And I turned the John Christian novel over. It says, read by Michael Beck. I'm like, Michael Beck? He was Swan in the Warriors. That was like, that's a Walter Hill classic. And then he was with Olivia Newton-John and Xanadu. Well, beside like a Matlock audition or a Matlock job, like in the 80s, he was banging out audiobooks. And I'm like, hmm, oh. So that was the first like little notch. And then at Voice Tracks, uh, <laughs> uh, I think Mark Cashman had put on a, a nice little uh, uh, class, took a class from him on audiobooks in 2011, and then <laughs> still didn't embed until late 2012. Pat Fraley, Scott Brick, Hillary Huber um, do a terrific class. And then Pat does classes with mo mainly Scott still. And um, uh, I had my demos made and then uh, sky was the limit. And I'll tell you, uh, it took about five years to become full time um, because audiobooks is like it's like the 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 uh, you know, it, it's like a like a distant moon. Like there's nothing that that is comparable in all the other VO stuff that we do to audiobooks because it's publishing. Right. So it's not necessarily entertainment. The rest of our stuff is like commercial entertainment or or, or TV or film and has some tie in a, a publishing is so different. So it's like a different animal that the protocols are all different how you approach people is, is different they don't like unless you're a name they don't want agents involved they're just a it's just an extra hat and the agent doesn't see that 10 percent as being like worth it to be in it for the residual payments so you you're your own marketer you're your own you're your own machine and you got to go out there and and then you learn how much to turn like how much to talk to people or, or not. And then how much is too much. And then when you go too much, you're not going to be able to talk to that person for another year. because you're <laughs> frustrating. So like it's, it's it, all this stuff is, uh, is you gotta, you gotta work all through it. And finally, you know, and then you become a publisher. There you go. That's awesome. 10 years later. <laughs> so I like it. I like the saga. The saga. The, the saga. saga continues. But we still love our, you know, <laughs> The, the video game, like the video games, I think are the, are the funnest sessions. There's nothing more fun than, than doing a, doing a, a kick-ass video game session. Nothing, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know. Getting you a character like that in some of the video games too, is just, uh, it can be wonderfully freeing. And it's a character that perhaps because of who you are, the way you look, you may not normally get, you wouldn't get a chance to play that character in a, a visual medium, but because it's sound and you can play anything, uh, it's wonderful to be able to slip into these roles and to immerse yourself and let a little, the little spark of you become something uh, brand new each time and and explore who they are. I love that about it. it it's, I think that as far as the different mediums are concerned, video games, uh, not just for the consumer, but I think for the performer can be one of the most immersive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 you know, and, and just the different types now that we have, you know, whether or not we're doing cinematics and whether or not that's in a space, whether or not we're, we have, you know, we're, we're mocapping or performance capturing or, uh, you know, whether or not we're doing the in-game play, you know, where we're banging out the ABC reads, um, you know, both have their own. What is, for those of us not in the industry, what is an ABC read? Basically you're, you know, uh, like say, say you, um, you know, in, in the game, you'll have dialogue that like when you do an action, the character will say something back to you. The ABC will be maybe different attitudes. 
Oh, um, or it could be it could be that they just want a three different reads on it, three different yeah. and they'll choose which one they'll and so once you give those those three those three reads, they'll normally go, okay, keep B and C, get rid of A, next one. And then you keep on moving. So you're it's very fast. It's very, very the, the sessions are very fast paced in that kind of style. I love playing the game later to see how interactive it can be, how it really meshes <laughs> together. Because sometimes when you're reading these scripts, they don't it's not linear. You don't have uh, emotions and not, it doesn't lend one lend right into the next, lead right into the next. You've got happy, sad, happy, tragic, you know, these, mm -hmm. these things that are just uh, all over the place. You're really just reading a paragraph and emoting a paragraph at a time. That's fun. What about, uh, what about you, Chip? Um, um, my mother, what, what was the question again? Oh, how we, how we got it. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, all right. So uh, I started going to uh, theater with my grandparents and, you know, I was always super envious, but I never like had the, the courage to do it or audition. And so uh, in, in high school um, I was a debater and my debate coach talked me into uh, trying out for one act play, Mr. Brian Sal, who believes it, believe it or not, he taught me in 81 and he still teaches at the high school today. Wow. So, yeah. So uh, I'm old. So anyway. <laughs> um, like, was he, was he like uh, a mentor? Was he like a mentor? Very much. Yeah. He, he talked me into doing uh, the one act play and I was like, ah, that, you know, no, that's not for me, whatever, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so flash forward uh, the next year and I'm working on my BFA and um, ended up graduating from UTA. And then when I went out to LA, and, and started doing on, on camera work um, and commercials and whatnot. My commercial agent moved to Arlene Thornton and Associates and uh, they asked me if I wanted to start doing voiceovers. I'm like, well, yeah, you know, I mean, that I would, you know, I did a little radio when I was young, so I, I'll, I'd love to give it a go. And uh, so, you know, it was really, you were talking about representation, Chris, really that's sort of what got me back into uh, voiceovers. And um, anyway, <coughs> So, yeah, so then uh, then I moved back to Texas and have my studio here and uh, COVID hit, of course. And uh, and like we were talking about pre-show, uh, that's kind of, you know, I was kind of prepping for that anyway. But I'm I'm sure I'm sure I could use um, some help from Jordan. I'm sure I could, uh, you know, get get some tips for sure. So. But anyway, yeah, Jordan's so next far. class is going to be very full. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Thanks. So I want to see that mic trick again. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Someone say Kirsten Dunst. Oh, God. Uh, that was totally <laughs> not on purpose. Yeah, and I literally banged the desk, and that's how the mic is so light that the springs mm. just shoot it up. So. It happens. You think that was the problem, Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am still a little You shouldn't red. be banging the desk. I know. Just, <laughs> anyway. I know. I, I'm not even single. Why am I banging desk? It's really sad. <laughs> Too much time alone out here. <laughs> but thanks for the question, Ken. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and last but not least, Keith. I have no fucking idea how I got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, people just started calling me. I, you know, I worked in the theater from when I was 19 and moved to New York, and they just started calling me after I did. I don't know. I had you know agents and stuff, but. Um, so I did Bleacher Bums there, which I was a writer of. But uh, yeah. I remember the first audio book that I ever did. Um, <clears throat> it was uh, it was a uh, Blue Highway by William Least Heat Moon, and I had actually read it while driving from Wilmington, North Carolina, to uh, to uh, Nashville, Tennessee, while I was doing a movie that shot in Wilmington and then in Nashville, and over one Thanksgiving weekend, and I read it and was just so oh, I drove all the blue highways. It's so cool. And the, I, I, they sent me the, the you know, they said, would you do this? I go, oh yeah. And back then they abridged everything, so uh, they sent me a script. You know, it had character names on it, not like the book. You know, I'm like, oh Jesus, what the hell is this? I better call. You know, and the the, the night before she calls the ed the editor, or whatever publisher calls me up and says so uh so what did you think of the of, of the book i go oh i i told her i didn't I, I read it before and it was just so great that i loved the book then uh, and i and, and i and i i asked her i said what part am i playing in it and there's this long pause <laughs> you know all of them and I went, oh okay <laughs> 
<laughs> but I had to learn every regional accent in the United States, which was interesting. So, wow. Was wow. <laughs> wow. That's a challenge. Uh, the Story of English by uh, Robert McNeil was actually a very good resource for that. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason, the way I got into show business originally is my mother put me in fucking tap shoes and made me dance with my cousin Joyce when I was four years old at oh, the Bedford Park <laughs> Community Center, you know, singing I've Been Working on the Railroad. And it, after, <laughs> I, I've never been this, you know. <laughs> Well, and then she had the gall when I was you. 19. What was that? I'm sorry. I said, obviously, it stuck with you. Made a big impression. Oh, I've done many other things, you know, since then. When, when I was 19, I was in a play that was at the Organic that was going from Chicago to Broadway. Uh, she came to see it and she goes, I said, well, mom, what do you think? You know, and she goes, are you really sure you want to do this, Keith? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, isn't that what you wanted me to do? She, 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 she actually later, my mother was a very difficult woman, but she was a great woman. And she said to the first uh, woman with whom I lived, she goes, when she met her, she goes, he was a very difficult child. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I think mom would even say, you know, you did okay after all. Nah, she wanted me to be a doctor or a president, you know, so she, I, I'm a failure as far as she's concerned. <laughs> well, I played doctors. I don't know if I've ever played there a president go. or not. Well, I played Yeltsin once. That was the first, uh, that it's was the first video game I ever did was someone who was like a, a, a nuclear, and I played Boris Yeltsin in it. it was, that was the first video game I ever did. And why I got that, I have no idea. <laughs> you also, uh, You've, you've also spent significant hours in makeup at times when you did uh, Stephen King's Golden Years. Yes. Yeah. Six mm. hours of makeup. Ten hours. Ten hours. Oh, ten hours of makeup. Ten, ten hours. Yeah. Ooh. Ten hours. And then it took an hour and a half to take it off. The very first oh day of God. shooting, there was a there was a hurricane warning, and the scene where I was supposed to ride this bike across to a, a ferry and then ride it across to the secret island where I worked, you know, uh, but there is a, they, you know, they brought me in at six in the morning and every couple hours we'd have a break. I'd go out and there'd be, you know, trucks and everybody would be shooting. And finally at, at, at noon, they broke me for, uh, for lunch, you know, then I, I finally, it, it was like four o'clock in the afternoon. They finally brought me out, you know, in, all, in my full regalia of makeup. Uh, and, um, and the, 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 uh, the hurricane had come and they canceled the shoot. Ne they never shot that. So that day oh. I worked 13 and a half hours and never actually did it. I got, I got put in makeup, had lunch and got taken out of makeup. That They're was afraid me. to put you on a bike and you'd be like, Annie M, Annie M flying around in the cycle. <laughs> right. Well, it would be a water spout and I would have been somewhere over the Gulf stream, you know, but seeing as I'm a scuba diver, I probably would have been okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I made it. But I mean, you've done some uh, some really amazing movies. Uh, Transformers, Dark of the Moon, where you play Laserbeak. Jerry, <laughs> you were always nice. Oh, no. My, my favorite fact, I killed Ken Leong in that. And the most favorite thing that I've ever done in anything in show business was I got to kill uh, John Malkovich. <laughs> That's a whole like, different movie. There's being John Malkovich, then, then there's, there's killing, killing John. Killing Malkovich. John Malkovich. Yeah, that would be the movie I would do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone in chat says uh, you blew them away as uh, as a kid when they saw you on Angel. Amazing performance on the the TV show Angel. Yeah, for two hundred years I slept. <laughs> two hundred years I dreamt of nothing but this moment. Mm. And uh, The Dark Knight, that's such an iconic action film, playing Stevens. Yeah, and you killed six of my friends. <laughs> I loved, I, I actually working with Heath was one of the great pleasures of my career. He was such a great guy. Yeah. Like real loss to lose him, you know. He was, you know, he had this huge part with like just volumes of, of dialogue, you know, but he never was an asshole. He was always there. He was always creative. He couldn't have been more supportive and just a nice, if you want to talk, talk, you know, it just, he, he and Gary Oldman couldn't have been nicer. Oh, yeah. Gary Oldman. I love Gary Oldman. Yeah. Just don't get married to him. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been like a, a master class of people just hanging around and doing that performance between you and Heath and uh, Gary Oldman. And just, uh, you know, what do you talk about at lunch? Well, lunch, usually, you know, whatever, you know, <laughs> Morgan Freeman and I had actually done a movie together. That was the one that I drove from Wilmington, North Carolina to Nashville and Sissy SpaceX car uh, called uh, uh, Marie, true story. 
Um, but, uh, and Morgan was pissed off at me back then. It was like 1984, I actually had higher billing than he did in the movie, but not, <laughs> obviously not in, not in, not in the dark night, but he, he remembered me and he was very nice. He was very kind to my, to my children, you know, so, uh, well, see, it really cool. was a ma master class. And Chris Nolan is indeed a genius and he knows it. Mm. Yeah. I've worked with a gentleman who, uh, uh, Jeremy Theobald, who was in Chris Nolan's first movie uh that they put together before he went and did um memento memento yeah that was and, such a good movie uh his name is jeremy theobald and he's been in everything he's had little small parts uh christopher puts him in these things and uh, uh he was actually in um the most recent one what was tenet? the one what's that tenet. tenet yeah he was in tenet he was the guy who was in the scene with uh uh michael kane who walked him into the scene with Michael Caine. That was uh, Jeremy, but it's just a really nice guy and speaks very highly of, uh, of Christopher, just as like a real, really decent guy. Yeah. The, the, if you take Memento, Inception and Tenet and even Interstellar, like these movies, like you can't, you can watch them once and then you're like, ah, uh, I liked it, but what the hell was going on? Uh, I got to go back in there. And then you go back into the hut and then you watch it again. And then you're like, ah, I still can't write. Maybe that's what it was. not that's not what it was about. It was about something else. <laughs> like, Tenet, did you know what it was like, about Keith? Your, no idea. <laughs> the time, the time that, the, the, I mean, he's big on time. His thing is time. It's all mm -hmm. like, like time. And, and that it's like incest. It's relative, you know, uh, God, uh, I, I, I don't, <laughs> Oh no. My brain is not good at that. <laughs> not good, Bob. The conversation ground to a halt. Nolan would just, my, my character wasn't that big, you know, and, and but he kept putting me in scenes, even after I was supposedly was dead. I mean, I wasn't dead, you know, and I, I'm even at, at the very end, I'm the cop standing behind uh, Gary Oldman as he smashes the bat signal, you know, and I'm actually in a police uniform. And, but but no one I don't know he got weird as uh, I mean as as it went on maybe I got weird on him I don't know uh, and and he would start saying things like you know Keith you remind me of Joe Joey Pants Joe Pantoliano and I go I I know Joey Pants I, and I consider that both a, an insult and and a, and a, and a, and, a, and applauded but thank you right I don't know what he meant by that. Yeah. <laughs> Do you uh do any of you have um interesting stories or memories from making Fallout? Could be Fallout 76 or any of the previous games that you've done. Uh the super mutant uh sessions were very sweaty. I do remember that. Doing all the super mutants for uh Fallout 3 is, is four hours of of high energy forcing that voice. I remember uh, Mark Lampert telling me that he felt like uh this this character Fox was uh an intelligent being but trying to communicate was like a gorilla trying to force uh, sounds through a, a voice box that was not meant for that <laughs> and uh so going through that for uh, over four hours i i really did i we had a conversation the other day about the faux pas of leaving sweaty headphones behind and i was really trying to keep those things in a decent <laughs> enough condition so the person who came in after me oh, wasn't like gross. okay yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. no! I hadn't even thought Free about COVID. that. Oh, so that was you that did that, that to the earphones. Yeah. Sorry oh. about that. <laughs> but though that I, I do recall, that was a very rewarding but very exhausting yeah. session uh, because it's 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 in effect it's like doing effort sounds for all four hours. Everything is an effort, and uh, doing efforts at the end of a session, and depending on how many characters you have, and then splitting those up and making each of the the efforts and the battle sounds that you do sound like the character is a bit of a challenge. So that's always fun. Yeah. Well, after I'd, I had done some of my super mutant stuff, I, I worked with Cal L as, as well. And um, I guess one of the things that uh, impressed me the most was how, how much they take care of you and how mm -hmm. much they take care of your voice. And as far as breaks go, or, you know, uh, if, if you're, you know, Again, going four hours with that is 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 a challenge. Going forty minutes sometimes is a challenge. So right, um, yeah. So it, it just that they uh, they took great care of me when uh, when I was there, and I, you know I'm I'm sure they do do all talent, which is which is wonderful. It doesn't always happen. So 
you know, super mutants and ghouls. That's an endurance test oh, yeah. of uh, the voice trying to keep that uh, that rough, gruff staying in the throat right. voice through the right. entire right. session can yeah. be difficult sometimes. Yeah, it, it ended up, uh, you know, they, they've gotten better at that over time. Every the whole industry has has gotten yeah. a lot better in the last couple of years at that. Yeah, um, I, I used to have sessions would just blow my voice, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I couldn't talk the next day, especially things like, you know, in, in combat sort of stuff. You know. Right. Oh, then leaving, Adrian Barbeau walks in. So that was that was kind of oh, fun. Cool. Speaking yeah. of, uh, Adrian Barbeau would have joined us today if not for an engagement. She sent her regards and uh, oh, wow. this the causes. Crazy. Yeah, she would have joined us today, but unfortunately. Great from Creep Show, man, was the best. I don't crazy. even get like I she uh, I loved her in the fog uh, and mm. loved her in everything. But yeah, she's going to uh, she wants to join us for the next one. That would be very cool. It's a very personal cool. cause for her too. My little story uh, goes back to Fallout New Vegas. And I mentioned earlier that I was doing walk-in for um, on the radio and they found out. I didn't tell them, they, they knew. So, and I know I haven't done it here. So um, at the end of the sessions, Wes Gleason and, and Mikey uh, uh, Dowling was also working on, on uh, audio then. It was part of the audio department. Now he's, I know he does communications for Obsidian now. Um, he, um, so they're like, hey, we want to do this section all as walking and we're going to have it as, as an Easter egg uh, mm -hmm. in the game. And so then I, I did probably, I don't know, maybe 50 lines or, 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 or 40, 40 lines as, as walking. And so the plan was to get it in there somewhere. I don't think it got in. I don't, I think they, I think so, uh, you know, somewhere along the line, the gatekeeper said, no, um, we're not going to, we're not going to allow this in the game, but it, but it was recorded. So that audio is somewhere, you know, where you have ghoul lines that are, that, you know, you have a walking ghoul out there um, that's just ready to be, you know, prouncing around the game somewhere. Sometimes they're embedded there in the games. People have found in some of the games I've done other voices and other characters that, you know, they have you voice a few things and they end up finding another actor down the road or they decide to mix and match that you voice it and somebody else voices it and then they flip you. But they somehow remain in the game and they find these things and it ends up on YouTube for years. Yeah, they're often packed in the BSA file so you can still find this stuff. Like uh, we were talking about this before we got started, Chris. Um, there was a cut character um, from the Campfire Tales quest. The one you were telling us about, yeah, um, the, Vincent Price, the Vincent Price character. Yeah, so sure. there was a there was a scenario, and and now that I read it, I want to hear it. Where one of the campfire tales was this haunted mansion tale that had a possessed doll, and Chris said it's him doing like it's, a Vincent Price narration voice for it. Yes, it sounds oh amazing. My God. Like I want that. It is. It is. I. I mean, uh, uh, Cal Cal directed, and it was. I mean, I was crying. We were crying crying i mean and then when you when you know you're crying in a session like that's that's gold like if you can get those takes out that's gold oh but again you know if it's it gold jerry well, oh my god you know it's gold um but but it's uh you know oh i wish uh, uh, hopefully well maybe you know it might have been i don't know so so cal directed so if, if he directed i'm trying to think of who um maybe if tyler Tyler Rhodes might might have a connection to try to try to get that audio somehow. I love I love Tyler Rhodes, by the way. He is a a, a great cool director. Very sure. nice. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a I've got a zoom with him soon. So um I'll mention something to see if see if we can get the ball rolling. <laughs> Jordan, uh sorry to interrupt you one sec, Chris. Sorry. Jordan also dropped a uh, a challenge here in chat to keep the donations rolling in. Um so if you have any requests for anyone here to say. Uh, he'll donate a hundred dollars, and the chat can pick the, uh, the pick the request. Hmm. Y'all pick. No pressure. Anything no pressure. Just, just just keep it appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> Smooth skin. You know, you you were asking about um, memorable days in um, in following yeah. on the game. Yeah. And Chris was talking about Christopher Walken and Viv comes from my doing one of the worst Christopher Walkens on the planet. 
<laughs> um, it's hideous. It's hideously bad. Is that where it comes from? What is it? Yeah, like, like a New York. What kind of? It's like a like a, a, a street urchin New Yorker. Uh, like no, a, it, a, basically, I, it's it's like a short circuiting robot. You know, it's like really twitchy. And so I walked in one day, and what are we working on? They said a drunken robot, and I said I have an idea. Oh no. <laughs> So we tried, we tried twitchy Christopher Walken and they kind of said, nah, um, but, and I, and, and twitchy Christopher Walken ended up being, uh, uh, he was inspired by Howie Mandel, you oh, know, nice. where Howie would do the reaching for stuff. <laughs> you, you know, 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 what I don't, you know, what I don't understand Spanish. <laughs> and it was it was it was based on that whole let, let me see if I can get this idea to be coherent. And that's where, yeah, so it was a mix between the horrible uh, horrible Christopher Walken and a, a pretty bad Howie Mandel. That is an amazing character origin story. <laughs> and it's amazing how if you like that this generation would not even know that like those HBO performances, like oh, how, yeah. good, how funny those HBO performances were. They how good how good of a stand up how Rick. Mandel is. Yeah. He's, oh, oh absolutely. Let me, let me tell you, I'm waiting until they, they forget who, uh, who Norm was, you know, because I, I got a lot of ideas for how to use that one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Have you seen Have you seen the the Netflix special? I haven't seen it yet, but I I want to. That's uh, amazing that they actually have that. Norm uh, Macdonald yeah, in his own living room. That's great, and they have, the, they have it's, it's a nice it's a nice round uh you know a, a round table um uh discussion at the end half an hour. But it's it, it's really interesting because you know you hear him nice up close. You know he's not projecting the <laughs> whole thing, so he, he has these ideas. And he puts them out there, you know. And no, I've been I've been listening to it a lot, but I forget where I was earlier today. But I was on the phone with my wife, and I just hear things coming out of my coming out of my mouth about life, and I can just hear an arm, you know. I just kind of say, yeah, yeah, it's kind of kind of quirky there, you know, that whole Supreme Court there, you know, kind of how they do the one thing with the guns, and then the whole other thing with the women is. He's on the same thing there. Crazy. <laughs> That's excellent. And, 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 and of course, you know, Carlin, you know, speaking of George earlier today, Carlin would have a lot to say about the times we're living in. My God, yeah. Yeah. Evidently, there's a clip of Carlin going around right now. He said so much about so many things that are still very current that uh, there is a clip going around right now after everything that happened today that uh, is really touching a nerve. So Carlin, it's amazing how Carlin and uh, Bill Hicks and guys like that uh, just shows you just how much we keep repeating ourselves because they're still current. Yeah, George Carlin documentary is great. It really is. Yeah, I love oh, that yeah. documentary. It's terrific. He he reinvented himself so many times. There's a guy who just uh, and eventually becoming who he really wanted to be, starting off being what he felt he should be, becoming what he wanted to be, but reinvented himself on a very high level like three or four times. We uh, are out of time because uh, we're, we've gone over a little bit. And then uh, Wes also has another thing right after this. We're going on tequila talk. Um, yeah, where we're going to have uh, John St. John, Duke Nukem, Alan yep. McLean from Portal, uh, John Patrick Lowry, George Ledoux, and uh, uh, it's going to be there. Casey's going to be running it, and it's going to be just as strange and weird as this. So if you guys want to come <laughs> join us, thank awesome. you all for coming. This is amazing that you came to do this today and help raise funds for Alzheimer's research. That time Against a Alzheimer's there, Neil. Against yes, Alzheimer's. I was going to say, yes. not actually yes. researching Alzheimer's per se. It's researching a cure. Yeah. I, yes. I'm just How curious. That that once people found out that we were actually against Alzheimer's as opposed to for it, how many people dropped out of the... Out of we the- lost a few. We lost yeah. a few, but that's okay. You know, they... they I think I we were better attitude without. to begin with. Yeah. Struggle. <laughs> well, I'll see you all. Thanks for having me on. Thank, Thank you, Keith. Be, uh, Paula, Chris. 
before so uh, before everyone runs off real quick, uh, if where can people find you, follow you, all of that good stuff? Uh, Keith. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, if you want to find Keith, you can put a flyer on a telephone pole. Uh, he may drive yeah. by and see it. In my neighborhood, hopefully. They'll, In they'll his see. neighborhood. Um, yeah, but I, I, I actually have a, a web series that I produced last year at the theater company. It was a make work project, but it was all SAG and, you know, IATSE. And uh, it's it's a six part uh, satiric comedic series with live actors in front of animated backgrounds called In Search of a Pig, a Pandemic Community Generator. And it's actually pretty fun. So That's you awesome. can find it on uh, on uh, what is it? Uh, Vimeo. Right. Oh, Vimeo, In Search yeah. of a Pig. Yeah, and YouTube, I think, yeah. yeah. We'll have to look that up. That's cool. It's actually fun, yeah. Mr. Chip Jocelyn. Uh, ChipJocelyn.com, simple, so. That's easy. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, and if you want to take classes. <laughs> oh, damn. Um, uh, yeah, JordanReynolds.com slash links. It's all my social media. I'm on Instagram and Twitter primarily. Uh, so yeah, you can hit me up on there. And, and as far as the core stuff that Neil was mentioning, it's, it's for home studio audio specifically. So thanks again, Neil. I really appreciate that. But yeah, yeah just throwing it me. out there, Jordan, but in the future, maybe you ought to make your, your panels back there, QR codes. <laughs> That's a genius <laughs> idea. That would, I, I can't, that's a specific mathematical equation on the panels. It's, it's literally well, like, I know what you need to find that. out. I'm Maybe checking now to see out. if it says anything here. Yeah, find out what QR oh, no. code it is and then grab that, <laughs> that site. You'll be fine. Uh, uh, it's like secret club stuff. Jordan has now collected Wes Johnson's social security number and credit card. <laughs> 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 That's exactly what it is. Right? Uh, Chris, also uh, teaching classes. I do have a, a website. That just that my performance site is chrisshula, C-I-U-L-L-A.com. Um, but most of the stuff that I am doing and teaching and putting out, uh, uh, publishing as far as for, um, uh, audio books and some, we're going to do, do some, doing some audio play stuff and we'll eventually be doing some audio gaming is all out of Leonardo audio.com. Um, and then, uh, our, uh, whatever we're teaching, the classes are under the workshop page there. So, um, and, but I have a mailing list there if they want to go to the about us page. And if people want to be on that mailing list, they can join the mailing list um, from that. And I have a discord server where I am uh, either directing talent or working on stuff myself that I'm allowed to um, uh, have a, as a stream. So um, they are welcome to Leonardo audio is uh, is a, um, a discord server if they want to find that. I'm going to join that. Paula. <laughs> Um, paulatiso.com is my website and my links to social media are there. I pretty much post on Instagram of what I'm up to, uh, Paula Tiso VO with underscores in between all that. And I, I have a new, um, I have a new TikTok, Paula Tiso underscore voiceover, where I've been doing a lot of my narration videos. I've been doing, moving more and more into narration. So that's awesome. That's about it. I do teach, but just kind of intermittently, and I post about it when it is going to happen. Thank you so much for having me, Wes. I really appreciate I'm it. I'm so grateful for you being here. I, I really am for all of you. It, it's meant the world. It really has. Neil. Uh, well, uh, speaking of Discord, I just create Discord wherever I go. <laughs> um. <laughs> You look it up, kids. It actually has a meaning. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm on I'm on Twitter, kneecap, N E K A P, uh, like the first two letters of Neil and the first three letters of Kaplan. It's people. Are, Why don't you spell it right? It's like, well, if you look at my name, it is spelled right. Anyway, kneecap on Twitter, uh, Neil Kaplan, voice actor on on the Fache book. Um, kneecap pics on uh on instagram and for my very strange little mini videos on tiktok kneecap tiktok kind of funny how that works so there you go stay in touch kids and kidlets kenneth can yes. i mention i i forgot about my just my my handle is uh i've got to use this boston voice guy yes. is, the, is the handle yep. sorry about that guys sorry. ironically never been to boston it's just a name 
Uh, this is his old name for brother curse. with the gang out of Chicago. It's a curse. Let and my good know. friend and co-host Carly here, where can people find you? Um, you can find me mostly on my Twitch channel, uh, Scully Face. Um, and on the Atomic Stop, also on Twitch. Nice. And that's all the time we have. So in... Uh, well, did we get Paula? Where's Paula at? Did we, we get did, you, Paula? We did, Paula. Paula. I did. Yep. Yeah. Okay, you can find me here. I'll be at other places. Uh, just go to Wes Johnson Voice on Twitter. And you'll also see Wes if you stick around. So in uh, now, tw sorry, 17 minutes, uh, Wes is going to be over on the El Gato Pub channel. And you'll be able to uh, tune in for Tequila Talk. Neil, did you have a question? Oh, I thought I saw your finger. No, I was, I was just kind of like pointing it, saying, you'll find Wes. I was just <laughs> helping to be dramatic. Bada -bing. I was just, you know. <laughs> thank you all thank for you, coming uh, out and doing yeah, this. It, you, it, it means the world. And uh, let's uh, let's beat Alzheimer's. And uh, we're all going to do it together in the gaming community. I'm grateful to you. And I know everybody here is grateful to you as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all very much. And uh, so stick around. And uh, yep, Shreds uh, on Elgato Pub is going to be going live in 16 minutes. So stick around for that. Good night, everybody. Good night. What's the 